the good guy.
But that's not true. Paul taught um, the doctrine of the rapture as a very important doctrine. He, he was only, remember the book of the, the, the two books that we call First and Second Thessalonians, and the book of Acts, where, where it gives a chronology of Paul's uh, missionary journeys. Though that book tells us that Paul was only in Thessalonica for two Sabbaths. Sabbath and Saturday. So that could be up to three weeks. You know, if he showed up on a Sunday and left on a Friday, he could pretty much get three weeks out of that. He was only there for three weeks, but he taught the doctrine of the rapture to all those new believers. They weren't old believers. They didn't become believers until he showed up. So he thought it was important enough that new believers should know about it. It's, it's most clearly presented by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. And here's what it says. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep. And that's a euphemism for those who have died. Okay? That you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, those also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, Comfort one another with these words. So, and by the way, he doesn't say comfort yourselves with the words that the Antichrist is going to show up and the tribulation is going to happen. He says comfort yourself with the words that the believers are going to be taken out. So at, at the rapture, all the living believers are caught up in the air changed or translated in the clouds in a moment of time instantaneously to join the Lord in the air. Yeah, it's interesting because last week at the first service this week, as you can probably know, we don't go exactly the first service, the second, second service. This next statement, some people believe that Jesus never spoke about the rapture. It's interesting because there was actually somebody, an older saint, wonderful woman of God, that did not understand and did not know how much he spoke about the rapture and didn't understand some scriptures. So we were able to take to her these scriptures and watch her eyes open up, which is a very good reason why these handouts that we gave to you guys, you need to be in those and reading those and allow the Holy Spirit to help you through these scriptures also. So once again, the, the comment I want to make was some people actually believe that Jesus never spoke about that correct? Absolutely not. Jesus did speak about the rapture. He, he spoke about it. One of the places he talked about it was at the Last Supper. You know, what we call the Last Supper. Consider this scripture. This is John uh, 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what he's talking about, folks. That's what he's alluding to right there. And notice this. If you study that scripture, John 14, You'll notice that that promise was given to believers. Judas had already departed. Let me, let me say something real quick. Uh, I want to say something about that right there. The person that I was talking about, the wonderful woman of God, and I'm telling you, she is a great woman of God. She actually did not understand that Judas was gone. This is a scripture that we brought to her to in, in chapter 13, and then she talks about it, and then 14, it is, it's like right to the point. 
My point in that is, folks, you don't know what the Bible says if you don't get in the Bible. Okay? You have to go through it for yourself. It's, it's, it's not enough to just think it. You need to know that it's there. Okay? So I'm not going to check. No problem. By the way, how many people got the handout last week? How many people kept the handout from last week? How many people don't have the handout from last week? Jeremiah, see those handouts? How about if you pass them? No, don't give them to me. I have mine. You Raise your hand, hand Jeremiah, start passing them out. These, these are here. You don't have to start at the beginning of this. There is no beginning or end. That's why there's no title of these handouts. You can start at any one of the Jeremiah, if, if, if they're sitting by each other, they can share. You're going to run out real quick, okay? Let's send them up. Anyway, be Bereans. Don't believe anything we say. Okay? Hear what we say. But search the scriptures to see if what we're saying is correct. Right. And so what we've done here is we've put together this handout so that it gives you the scriptures that you can go to to see the viewpoint that we're coming from. All right? I, I, I thought it was important enough that we needed to, to say that. Um, one of the things that uh, occurs throughout Scripture is Jesus using marriage and marriage ceremonies as uh, parallels or as, as stories to uh, illustrate different points. And, and there are some amazing parallels with the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony and the rapture of the church. Consider these things, okay? After the engagement, the engagement, by the way, when people got engaged in the society, it wasn't like today. Well, you get a ring, or maybe you don't get a ring, and the plan is sometime down the road, if things work out, we're going to get married. You know, whatever. And then, you know, we'll have a real commitment once we get married, if we decide to get married. That's not what the Bible says, and that's <coughs> certainly not what the ancient Jewish ceremony was. Remember the story of Jesus' birth, when Mary and Joseph were headed to, uh, Jeru uh, to Bethlehem, to the census, and uh, the Bible says they were betrothed. And Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant and decided to divorce her. Well, they were engaged. They were married. But in that society, when you were engaged, if you wanted to do away with the engagement, you had to have a formal divorce. It was a commitment at that point in time. The marriage was not consummated physically, but you were considered married when you were engaged. Okay? So consider these parallels. After the engagement, before the formal ceremony, the groom <coughs> left to prepare a home for his bride. And it was usually an addition to his father's house. Wow, that's kind of cool. Probably just a coincidence, huh? <laughs> the bride didn't know when he was coming back. She was kept in a state of expectancy. She was required to expect him to return any time. <coughs> Gee, another coincidence. The return was usually in the middle of the night as a complete surprise. And after the final ceremony, there was a seven-day celebration. You guys see the parallels between the rapture of the church and the marriage? Okay. Um, many of you that was with me at Center of the Faith, you've seen when we put the, I think it's called Kupa, that we put that thing up where the, uh, they did the Jewish uh, wedding. What we're going to do, I'm going to talk to Tom about it, but what we're going to do sometime in the future, we want to try to put on a Jewish uh, wedding so that you can actually see the parallels exactly in how things are going. I think you will enjoy that. One of the things I want to say, Tom, was, was I noticed that it seems to be a literal resurrection 
of the dead in addition to believers that are alive at the time of the resurrection? Absolutely. There, here, there's a couple of passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, to consider. Okay, Job speaks of a bodily resurrection in his book, which is we, what we consider the oldest book in the Bible. There's one for your Bible trivia class. What's the oldest book in the Bible? Job. Written before Genesis. Pretty amazing. Job says this, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand in the last days upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What Job is saying is that even though his present body decays, anybody here body decay? Amen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Even though his body's decaying, his flesh, in his flesh, in his flesh, he's going to see God, and his eyes shall see his Redeemer on the earth. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Here's another passage. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 55. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? So in this passage, Paul's saying that when Jesus returns to the believers, there's still going to be one generation of people alive who haven't died yet. Paul tells what happens to the generation of believers still alive at the time. Now, that passage stated that this will happen at the last trump. Some of you will be reminded of that. The, uh, the question that I had was, aren't there seven trumpets in the book of Revelation? Is that when this takes place? No. Next question. No. <laughs> this is the last in a series of trumpets. Okay? Um, it's not necessarily the last trumpet to ever sound forever. There's no reason to believe there won't be more trumpets sounding, uh, especially during the millennium. Remember that in uh, temple worship, trumpets were used. There's going to be a millennial temple. There's no reason to think that's the last trumpet ever. Let me, let me give you um, an analogy, an, an example. One of the schools I went to, for every class, there was a first bell and there was a last bell. You were expected to be at your desk with your study materials open, ready to go when the first bell rang. <laughs> If you were still on your way to your desk, or you didn't have your books open, you weren't ready to go, you were considered late. And you got marked tardy. You only got so many tardies, you got kicked out of class, you got kicked out of class, you got corrected, et cetera, et cetera. There were consequences. Three minutes later, the last bell rang. If by that time you weren't at your class, at your desk, with your books open, ready to go, you were marked absent even though you were there. You weren't given any credit for that class. At least you got the notes, because you took them. If you finally got your papers in. But the point is, that was certainly not the last bell that ever sounded. That happened for every single class. Do you get it? So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, last bell, in, I mean the last trumpet in a series. And it's, so it's not necessarily that one. It's probably the last bell that the believers are going to, I mean, the last trumpet that the believers are going to hear before they're taken. The, here's the point. Throughout Scripture, we're told to expect Jesus to return at any moment. It's not, look out to the Antichrist. 
It's not look out for the tribulation. It's look up. Your redemption draws near. When you see these things happen, and we'll talk about some of those things as we move along, lift up your eyes, for your redemption draws nigh. Okay? So, in the handout, one of the sections of the handout are imminence scriptures. There's a list of imminent scriptures there. Check them out for yourself. Read what they say. And see what the Bible has to say about expecting the Lord to return at any minute. Which brings up the point that you're going to hear a lot today. And you're going to hear a lot next week. Get the hand down. Get in the scriptures. And see what it says. You're going to keep pushing and pushing and do that. We believe, here at New Beginnings, we believe... That the rapture and the second coming are two separate events. The medieval church, both Catholic and Protestant, both forth or put forth the view that somehow they were both the same. Correct? That's right. Absolutely. <coughs> There's a number of indications in Scripture that indicate they are distinct and separate events. The handout has a list of rapture <coughs> and second coming. <coughs> Scriptures. Read them. They seem to be, if they're the same thing, they're contradictory. The only way they make sense is if it's two separate events. We're to expect the imminent gathering of the church. Before we get done here, and that might make some of you happy, we can come back for it. Okay? Check those passages out for yourselves. But here and now, right now, we're interested in what's going to happen after the rapture of the church. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Here's some things to consider. There's going to be great chaos in the world right after this happens. You think there's unrest in the world today? You don't have a clue. How many people are in the world? Well, you know, anybody know what the population is? And I mean, generally speaking, five million. Seven billion. Seven billion. Yeah. Over seven million. A billion. Seven seven billion. billion. Yeah. That's what I'm mean. <laughs> Seven billion. Over seven billion. Millions and maybe even a billion people are going to vanish in the twinkling of an eye. What is happening? Some of those people are going to be airplane pilots. Some of those people are going to be truck drivers. Some of those trucks that are running down I-5 that are out of control today, maybe they got raptured. I don't know. I'm sure some of those people are not so good. But imagine all of them or a whole slew of them like that. Right. Yeah, okay. Anarchy is going to break out. Um, law enforcement is not going to be able to cope with the problems. Uh, all things are going to continue to get worse and worse and worse really fast before they get better. Okay? Uh, wars could break out. We talked last week about um, the Magog invasion. That could be happening very shortly after uh, the rapture. That's where Russia comes down with Iran and that group of allies that invade Israel. Uh, look what's happening in Syria today, Egypt today. <coughs> We're poised, people. Uh, we could have nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. Who knows what else? So, Christine, I think by the way you and I would say it is people are going to be freaking out. That's right. Absolutely. But, but here's the deal. And, and, and hear this. If you're still here after the rapture, you know the truth about what happened. You didn't go. You weren't taken. You're still here because of your spiritual condition. You have not yet made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Bottom line is, guys, just told me to send you. You need to accept it today. <laughs> today is the day of salvation. It is imperative that before this service is over, you're going to get an opportunity. Amen. You just have to say, Lord, come into my life. I'm sorry. Amen. 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 There's going to be lots of explanations put forth for what just happened. Now here's the really scary part. The scary part isn't only what happens after the rapture. As 
far as, you know, the book of Revelation and all that stuff we'll talk about. The scary part is that the Bible makes it clear that because people heard the truth and refused to believe when they heard it, that God sends them a delusion that they would believe the lie. In Greek, that definitive article, the, is in there. It's not just any old lie. It is a specific lie. Here's the scripture that backs that up. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 through 12. And then the lawless one will be revealed, that's after the rapture, whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, whose coming is, in according, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. And for this cause, because they didn't believe, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, so that all those who do not believe the truth but delight in unrighteousness might be condemned. Okay, so wait a minute. Let me ask what I know someone's thinking right now. Wait a minute. The delusion comes from God? Because I thought God wanted everybody to be saved. Yes, he does. That's absolutely correct. The Bible makes it clear that God desires that everybody be saved. But it also makes it clear that not everybody accepts his salvation. We are creatures with free will. Okay? We have to choose. The Bible says you're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God, lest anybody be able to boast. But we still can refuse to accept the truth. Okay? So, so if, if what he's saying is that these people had their chance during the church age, the day of grace, and that now it's too late. Now it's too late. They won't believe now no matter what happens. So does that mean that nobody's going to be saved after the rapture? No, not at all. The Bible makes it clear that millions, perhaps billions of people are going to be saved after the rapture. But remember, there's people in the world today who never heard the gospel. They're not going to be accountable for the lie they haven't heard and refused. Okay? Uh, some scholars believe that, that there may be more people saved after the rapture than were actually taken in the rapture. That's kind of interesting. The Holy Spirit is still going to be active and drawing people to the Lord. What this scripture says is that those who heard the gospel before the rapture and refused to believe will believe the lie. And they won't accept Jesus even after they've seen the believers taken. Look and now, by the way, <coughs> you've heard the truth. You're accountable. Let me, let me say something real quick. Uh, because many of you out there was raised just like I was. And I'm not going to split hairs with anyone. I know that some of you believe, some of us believe, that after the rapture takes place, that we can be saved, even though we hurt. Here's what I want to give to you real quick. If you... In the day that we live right now, with everything that we have, with all of our freedoms, think about it for a moment, kids. All of our freedoms, the grace of God all around us, <laughs> able to come to church and freely hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we cannot accept Him now, do you really think, as hard as it's going to be, that you're going to be able to do it? You need to think about that kind of stuff. You mentioned a lie. I'm very curious. What, what is this lie? Well, we don't know. But we can speculate. There's lots, lots of possibilities out there. And think about these. The lie could be evolution. Evolution versus creation is taught in our schools today, not as a theory, but as fact. That, you know, we went 
from the goo to the zoo to you. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I have some weird looking relatives, but I don't think they're relatives. Are dumb. <laughs> Just not there. Panspermia could be the lie. What does that mean? Panspermia is the belief that the earth was seeded from life. Seeded with life from somewhere else in the universe. Have, how many have ever heard of the face on Mars? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's very interesting. Uh, when one of the Mars expedition deals went to Mars, they, it was not a lander, they just orbited and they took a lot of pictures. Some of the things they saw were pretty amazing. One of them is a, an apparent rock formation that looks like it's man-made and it looks like a face. And it's not just, you know, a little <coughs> profile like the rock that sort of looks like maybe it was possibly if you're stone that was a man. It's <laughs> nothing like that. This face is a straight on picture. And it looks like the Sphinx in Egypt. It's got the little headdress thing that the Egyptians wore and everything. It's amazing. In the same area are a whole bunch of pyramids. Are they real? I haven't got a clue. I haven't been there. But the fact is that they show up. And so people say, ah, that's where the ancient Hyksos came from. That's where the ancient Egyptians came from. Anybody see Stargate? That movie? Okay. That's where that whole idea came from. That life started out there somewhere, and this wonderful race brought life to the earth and seeded it. That's panspermia. That could become prominent. Here's another one. UFOs came. The aliens took all these people away who were holding back humanity from reaching the next level. Okay? Or, how about this one? This one's scary <coughs> to me. That couldn't have been the rapture. Look how many church people there still are. It's interesting to note that Revelation 2 and 3 uh, contain seven <coughs> letters written to seven different churches by Jesus Christ himself. He's the author. We don't have time to go into all of them now. It's amazing. It's an amazing study. But be aware of this. The seven churches in the order that they're in correspond to what we know of the history of the church from Pentecost to the end. The church age that we're in today corresponds with, the condition of the church corresponds with the seventh church, the last one. Okay? In Revelation chapter 2, the church of Thyatira, which corresponds to the papal church, the Catholic church, is promised to go into the Great Tribulation. Ooh. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus tells the church at Sardis, which by the way corresponds to the Reformation church, what came out of the Reformation? Protestantism. In case you don't know, we're considered Protestants. Okay? That group of people is told that they are asleep and will not be aware of his coming at the time of the rapture. That's kind of scary. And he also tells the church of Nicaea, which is the last church, today's church, the apostate church, that because those people are neither hot nor cold, they're only lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. A lot of translations will say, 
spit you forth or whatever, but the translation is vomit you out of my mouth. Here's the, here's the, uh, here's the scripture for you. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You've all heard this. It's all about evangelism, right? It's all about an invitation to salvation. Well, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will stop with him, uh, sup with him, and he with me. Look at the context of this scripture. It's not evangelistic. Jesus is standing outside the door of the last day's church, not going to come in. I hope you got that right there. Scotty, come and grab the guitar, man. Um, I hope you got that last part you said. Wait, say it again. The, the scripture itself, behold, I stand at the door and knock, is not talking about evangelism. It's not talking about the laws. He's standing outside the door of the last day's church. What it intimates is that he is not in a lot of last day's churches. It's all about programs. It's all about stuff. It's all about busy work. It's not about Jesus. We have, he, a, lot of, we have a lot of socials. Yeah. have a lot of eating. Yeah. We have a lot of playing. But how does Jesus do that? That's really what he's saying. He's outside the door of the church saying, let me in, please. And we're basically saying, well, who are you? Do you hear that? Who are you? So what's the point? I want to give you a couple things here, and I want you to listen to them with everything you have. Number one, what's the point? The point is that what I told you a little while ago, today is the day of salvation. The second thing is this. God has no grandchildren. Yeah, that's right. Yep. He has no grandchildren. He only has children. That's right. In other words, you're not going to be saved because grandma and grandpa are saved. You're not going to be saved because aunt and uncle are saved. You're going to be saved because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Period. If any time you're ready, Scotty. <laughs> well, preacher, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about all these great things that I'm hearing all these great churches are doing? Understand this. Not everything that looks good is good. Not everything that looks great is great. Let me blow your mind just for a minute. Because I, I must tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, as somebody who is a clergy... As somebody who is responsible for souls, what I'm about to tell you spiritually ticks me off. Absolutely disgusts me. And I think you have a right to know where I'm coming from with some of this horrible doctrine and this so-called God stuff or Holy Spirit stuff that is running rampant in Roseburg. And in our community. There is a church. I won't name it. Come to me afterwards. I'll be glad to. There is a church in our community. That brags and boasts. About gold dust falling from the ceiling. You know how I feel about that. You go to a church. And gold dust starts to fall. Gather it up. Bring it back. So we pay our church off. I have never one time. Whether it was in Redding, California, getting close to naming them. Whether it was in Redding, California, a huge church, when the gold dust begins to fall down, I have never one time heard of anybody gathering up the gold and analyzing it and finding out it was real gold. I have heard about a church that said the gold dust was falling down. They went up to find out what it was. And they had stored a lot of Christmas stuff up there. And the music being so loud began to shake off of the Christmas tree some of the dust. And people got excited. They called it the Holy Ghost. Don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. I had somebody in my own church who is not going to church here any longer. I guess because he didn't like what I had to say. This is me. He 
brought to me because he went to a revival in this town. Listen, guys, I'm just trying to help you out. I don't want you to get sucked up in all that. <coughs> well, I start saying bad words right there.
Because most human beings, they want the gold. Over the gold. Hope oh, you got that. They want the gold, the junk. They want the fluff over the truth. And see, here around New Beginnings, we only know how to do one thing. Give you the truth. But when everything else fails, when the butterflies can't be bought anymore, when the Christmas trees don't have any more dust on them, the truth will always remain. Just say it. One more piece of good news. Rapture has not taken place yet. And you don't have to go through the tribulation. Amen. You can accept him right here. Right now. Today. Not based upon butterflies or gold, but based upon this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have ever lasting life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this day. What a powerful teaching was given to us today. Lord, if there's anybody here today that simply doesn't know you as their personal Savior, then today is the day of salvation. Heads are about nice and close. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want anybody looking around. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I've tried it my way, and my way hasn't worked. I need Jesus. I've done it my way. It isn't happening. I need Jesus. If that's you, I just simply want you to raise your hand in the air and back down. That's all I want you to do. Anybody at all? Bless you, sissy. Anybody else? Anybody else? Could everybody please stand? <laughs> I know there's only one hand that went up, but I wonder if there might be a few more. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Let's just do it in the beginning style. Let's all say this. Would you repeat this after me, please? Would you just simply say, Father, Father in Jesus' name, in Jesus name I, come I come to you. I've tried it my way. Forgive those who 